Perfect. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Eitan Bremler, uh, one of the co-founders and VP of corporate development here at Safety. And today, uh, the topic of our presentation is a, a year 2020 recap uh, in terms of cybersecurity events, some of the uh, attacks we saw and uh, the, the analysis of these attacks. Um, as, and we will then go on and talk about safety solutions and how uh, we believe we could have helped either completely prevent or really reduce uh, the attack effect. So we'll start with talking a bit about safety. Um, safety, we are an Israeli uh, company uh, based out of Tel Aviv, uh, founded uh, back in 2013, uh, publicly traded both in Tel Aviv and in NASDAQ. Uh, global company, uh, like I said, headquarters in Israel, offices in Germany, UK, Spain, uh, US, um, around Asia, PAC and Africa. So global in the sense of the safety presence as well as global in terms of customers. We have customers around the world in a variety of verticals. Uh, we are covered by all the leading analysts within the space. So we play in the uh, zero trust network access space as ZTNA. Um, and so we're covered by Gartner and Forrester in their different reports. Uh, you can see here um, a few of the reports by Gartner. Uh, you can see we have consistently been appearing in all the different ZTNA related reports uh, since 2018, uh, we're actually one of the first uh, pure ZTNA players, um, and you will see our technology moving forward. A bit of our customers, uh, you can see we have a variety of uh, customers in a variety of verticals. Uh, we play across verticals, it could be financials, large corporations, government, healthcare, as well as cloud. Uh, we have MSSP providers like Accenture and Fujitsu, uh, who sell and resell our uh, technologies uh, under their brand, as well as a variety of um, customers. If you're looking at the DAH region, uh, we have Lavego, who's a fintech, and Temenos, who, are, who is a fintech. Um, we have in the Netherlands uh, and uh, Philips and Signify. We have here in Israel uh, government agencies, as well as in the US and medical institutions. So our solutions really fit <clears throat> Sorry, uh, all types of verticals. Um, so we'll start with looking at kind of what happened uh, back in 2020. Um, and we focused on four types of attacks, which were kind of uh, common throughout uh, 2020. These are the ransomware attacks, data breaches of people, you know, uh, going into the organization, either inside a threat or external to, to steal data, credential thefts and VPNs attacks, so attacks on actual VPNs. And what 2020 uh, showed, and you can see here, we, we kind of gave an attack per month. Uh, for, uh, many, many, each month there was attack. Uh, one of the statistics of 2020 is that the first six months of 2020 had more cyber attacks than the entire of 2019. Um, There's a really rise uh, in attacks, a lot of it uh, during COVID because people were working from home. So there's a lot of remote access, people not really used to connecting from home. So they were really subject to attacks and kind of very, a lot of potential victims to utilize to jump into the organization. Uh, we had seen VP uh, attacks coming both insiders and externals and a new type of attack, which was pretty new for 2020, which is the VPN attack. Again, uh, we attributed a little bit for the higher use of VPNs uh, during COVID. And pretty much many of the VPNs were hacked. You can see here Pulse and Palo Alto and Fortin adjusted three VPN vendors, but there were many other VPN vendors um, attacked Chinese vendors, other American vendors, as well as ransomware attacks that also uh, grew immensely. Um, you can see January will travel actually for ransomware attack and SD Louder a data breach. Marriott in March was a credential theft. Uh, Pulse, like the Palo Alto and Fortinet in April, July, um, and November. Uh, EasyJet, uh, University of San Francisco, uh, Intel, um, a uh, medical uh, university in Germany, HHU in September. Um, and of course, SolarWinds, uh, a very large attack in December. Just this week, there was actually a an attack which eclipsed that, the Microsoft Exchange hack. 
in our presentation, we will analyze and focus three of these attacks, uh, the Pulse Secure attack and specifically a customer who got hit, the US, uh, University of San Francisco attack and the SolarWinds attack. So we'll start with the Shearbit insurance company. This is an Israeli insurance company, uh, which was hacked by their uh, Pulse Secure VPN. Um, you can see here the attack uh, flow. Basically what the attackers utilize is a vulnerability in the Pulse Secure VPN, which was since then patched, but was still uh, open at that time. The hackers utilize that vulnerability um, to basically bypass uh, the VPN authentication. Uh, once they bypass the VPN, they gained access into the company and started laterally, move, laterally moving around the organization, stealing sensitive information. Um, and in, as opposed to uh, encrypting the data, they stole the data and held it as a ransom to get paid um, and otherwise releasing the information. So they took kind of a different, it's more of a data breach uh, hack than specifically um, a, uh, a ransomware. Um, in terms of the damages of this attack, so basically Sherbit did, uh, did not agree to pay. So the attackers leaked the information. These were personal IDs, passports of really high profile people in the Israeli uh, government, military, and industry. They leaked medical information and it was a very, very bad publicity for the insurance company. Um, one, because they hacked, two, specifically uh, because how they dealt with the hack. Um, and basically, they, like, again, like I said again, they came through their Pulse Secure VPN. The SolarWinds hack, uh, basically one of the, maybe the largest hack um, in 2020. Uh, and up until this week, one of the largest hacks ever. Um, what in this case, the attackers utilized a vulnerability and backdoor in the SolarWinds Orion platform. They actually hacked the SolarWinds Orion within, uh, during development and deployed malicious code into that, uh, into Orion. So when Orion was deployed and utilized by uh, SolarWinds customers, and this is, we're talking about almost 20,000 uh, organizations around the world, they basically hacked through the software. And through the software, they connected back to their uh, command and control servers, um, stole uh, credentials, and really laterally moved around the organization, uh, stealing information, what we call the crown jewels. Uh, this was a very, serious brand hit for SolarWinds. You know, everybody knows SolarWinds was hacked. Now, um, their customers, uh, again, 18,000 enterprises were exposed and uh, hacked. And uh, the, there's a statistics here. You can see that we're talking about damages above $100 billion, uh, okay? Just to fix and contain uh, what happened because within this 18,000 enterprises, there were government agencies in the US. So the a very wide range of organizations. And in this case, again, they hacked through a vulnerability that they found in the third party software. Think about all the third party software you use in your organization, right? Microsoft Exchange just this week is another example. Uh, we run after patching, but there always will be this zero day attack on some other third party software we're not aware of. So this is something to think about when we move forward within the presentation. And last but not least uh, is the UCSF ransomware attack. This is the University uh, of San Francisco. They are actually a COVID research uh, facility. Um, in this case, standard ransom attack, right? The hacker sent out an email, phishing, um, caught a, a victim, right? The ransomware was deployed after opening the email. And what they did then is spread within the network and uh, encrypted file shares, right? They mainly uh, looked at file shares, encrypting them, uh, pretty much standard ransom attack. Uh, in this case, the ransom was paid, uh, over a million dollars in ransom, very bad press for UCSF. Um, and also potentially link of a COVID research. And like I said, they are a COVID research facility. So three different attacks, right? All commonalities are access, right? There's an access phase, either an external access 
or an internal access, right? So three different attacks. We talked about a ransomware, a data breach, and a VPN attack. So seemingly different analogy is they all have an access vector. Again, could be internal or could be external. All the other attacks as well. If you look across this grid here, very common. All attacks in the world today have an access vector. And as an access company, this is exactly the vector we look um, to block and close. So what we offer to the market to address such attacks is our ZTNA platform called Zone Zero. Uh, Zone Zero is a software-only solution. Uh, and the goal behind Zone Zero is to take all access use cases, external users, regardless of how they come through a VPN or non-VPN or internal users and unify them and control all of the access use cases using ZTNA concepts, zero trust concepts. We do this by combining four main technologies. Our reverse access patent, which is our patented technology, the basis for our uh, solution. Our software defined perimeter, technology for non -VPN, for external non-VPN users, integration and enhancements with company VPNs. So we integrate and connect to organization VPNs and integration to the company uh, multi-factor and identity provider uh, solutions. By unifying all of these together, we can now act as a zero trust gate, if you will, or controller between any type user be them an internal user, like a corporate employee, or external users coming from the outside, like remote workers or work from home users, or to the company like third party vendors, contractors, supply chain, between all of these types of users and the corporate data, regardless of where it resides. What we sell and what we deploy at our customers' locations is what you can see here, zone zero, is basically a virtualized container. In it, we deploy the safety virtual machines. They're either two machines, the two main machines are the access controller and the access gateway. And you can choose to add an additional authentication gateway, really depending on the use case. We'll dive into this in a few slides. So the customer, this is a customer deployed and managed solution. It's basically a product. The main component is the access controller. The access controller is the component managing the gateways. It also goes out to the gateways to retrieve data. It's an outbound based technology. The access controller is the one connecting to the corporate applications. And the access controller also connects to the company, to the corporate IDP or MFA solution. We are a clientless and agentless solution. We don't require anything to be installed on the uh, corporate resources nor do we require anything to be installed on the client machine. The end user, the client can be an internal network user, could be a VPN user, a non-VPN user. They connect to the gateways. The controller goes out to the gateways to pick up information. The basis for our technology is what we call the reverse access patent. As I showed here, these arrows pointing out this is the way they work. The controller goes out to the gateways to retrieve information. So if we kind of zoom in to how our reverse access technology works, we have the controller, we have the gateway. The controller has a open control channel, always pulling and checking the gateway. Any request a user send, sends to the access gateway on a TCP level, we look at TCP, the controller senses this over the control channel, goes out and pulls in the request. The request is then sent to the business application. The response is sent back out. The firewall here is configured from the inside out. So our solution on its base also provides logical segmentation of networks. You can disconnect the LAN from the DMZ logically by basically redirecting the way traffic flows. The firewall is configured from the inside out no open ports on the firewall, yet we maintain a full session. And this again, this reverse access is the basis for the safety technology. On top of this, we add the authentication phase depending on the use case. 
So let's start talking about the different use cases. And we'll start talking about the non-VPN use case or what we call the Zone Zero SDP product. The idea behind Zone Zero SDP is to provide zero trust-based access for, non, for external users, non-VPN users. It's based on the patent. The idea is to separate authentication from access. It supports all legacy applications and protocols. We are clientless on the one hand, yet we support all corporate type applications on the other hand. And it is to work either instead of the VPN or parallel to the VPN. <clears throat> the solution can be deployed fully on-prem, as you can see here, or in a hybrid approach, as I will show in a second. The deployment is very easy. We have the access controller located in the LAN. It, again, has routing to all the backend uh, corporate applications and is connected also to cloud applications. It has connectivity to the on-prem or cloud identity providers, and it has connectivity to the gateways. As you can see, everything is outbound. So the controller is the one managing everything. If a user on the left wants to connect to a resource on the right, they need to do authentication first by opening a browser, connecting to authentication gateway, go through the authentication phase where the controller goes out to the authentication gateway, retrieving information. And only after you go through authentication on the controller authentication pair, does the controller open the access gateway to allow users to connect. And when you connect, you just open up your uh, relevant client application and I will show you a demo at the end. You open the client application and you connect to the uh, service. So the idea is to allow any type user coming from the outside, could be an employee or a non-employee coming over the mobile device or a desktop to connect to corporate resources located either on-prem or in the cloud. No client device required, no client agent re required on the user, no agents required on uh, the devices and the firewall here, most importantly, again, configured from the inside out. Fully software solution, you get the v virtual machines from safety. The same solution can be deployed as a hybrid cloud offering where we as at safety run the gateways for you, the customer, and you manage the controller. Or uh, you can consume this from our MSSP providers where they run the gateways in their cloud. The next uh, use case is what we call the Zone Zero VPN. This is supporting VPN users. The idea here is not to sit in the VPN, but rather sit after the VPN. The flow here, as you can see in the arrows, the user connects to the VPN using their VPN client. So there's no authentication gateway here. We sit after the VPN. You'll see this in the demo later on. The VPN authenticates the user. Once the VPN has authenticated the user, it updates zone zero that the new user has been connected and zone zero sends an MFA to the remote worker. The, and only if, if the remote worker accepts this MFA does zone zero approve the user to access. So the idea here is to sit as a second line of defense after the VPN. As we will see, if this solution would have been deployed uh, in the Sherbet account after the Pulse Secure VPN, we could have prevented the hacker from bypassing the VPN and getting into the network because we would be sitting behind requiring the user to do the MFA. Now, if the user does not accept the MFA, zone zero becomes closed. So you, this, so you cannot connect to the network. If the user finishes the authentication, then the user, when they connect to a backend service, the VPN routes the traffic to us and reroute the traffic into the network. So again, we control the traffic going into the network. This also allows us to initiate multi-factor authentication as a re-authentication flow. If a user connects to a application, we can re-authenticate the user. We'll see this in a demo. So even if a user has been able to steal credentials and connect to the VPN, if they go to a sensitive application, we can re-authenticate them or even send a request for authentication to that user's uh, manager to ensure 
uh, a correct connectivity. So we can add a really strong um, second layer of defense after VPNs. Plus, when the user connects uh, after the VPN through Zone Zero to the backend network, they only have application level connectivity. There's no network connectivity, no lateral movement allowed. You only connect to the applications you are allowed to. So what we get with Zone Zero VPN is a variety of benefits. On the operational side, the solution is transparent. It's a bump in the wire. We put it after the VPN. We just configure the VPN to route traffic to us. That's it in terms of the network. Very quick, very easy. We support all commercial VPNs. So it's, we pretty much support all of them. From a security perspective, we basically isolate the VPN from the network because the VPN does not route traffic into the network anymore, only the authentication phase. All the rest is routed by us. Users are elevated to work on layer three, layer four. We disconnect lateral movement. We disconnect the tunneling and it's transparent for the user. Right? They don't need to change the way they work. Last use case is what we call the zone zero MFA. This is supporting internal users. This uh, scenario, as you will see, could help prevent attacks of uh, uh, types like SolarWinds, where after I hack an initial server, from that I start jumping to other applications. Now, the, the reason that is a, uh, happens with SolarWinds is because we do not have MFA today in the network. It's not trivial to add MFA to corporate applications. If it's a web application, it's one thing, it's easy. What do you do with the client-based applications, the thick applications, legacy protocols? They do not support MFA today. It's a big challenge to add it. You need to open the code, do customizations, ask the third-party vendor for help. What Zone Zero MFA does is centralized MFA. We can sit between the users and the applications, and we support all corporate applications, and we initiate MFA for those users. So we sit, as you can see here, between users and the corporate applications. When the user is trying to go to any backend application, let's say I am a user and I'm trying to go to this file share, I open my file share. I connect, I hit zone zero, zone zero sees that I'm going to a file share, sends a command to issue me an MFA. Only after I prove the MFA does zone zero allow me to connect to the file share. This allows you to do centralized MFA to any backend resource back without changing the application, without requiring agents on the application, without changing user behavior, except for adding and the MFA client, depending on the MFA vendor you choose. We can sit uh, in a micro-segmented network where users and uh, servers are in this different networks. We can also sit in a flat network where everybody's sitting on the same VLAN. It's just a bit of a tweaking to the applications. This allows uh, preventing, or this prevents jumping from application to application uh, if there's an attack. So if I hack your SSH, and I try to go to a finance app, that will cause an MFA action and will require the user to authenticate. So we can prevent jumping from one application to the other, which is basically lateral movement within the attacks. We have a specific uh, use case we call Zone Zero Secure File Access or SSA, which is a micro use case specifically for file shares. So you can deploy only zone zero SFA to protect specifically file share access. If that is a use case you want to protect with MFA, it's the exact same thing as zone zero MFA, but tied and pinpointing for uh, SMB file shares. So if we take all of this information and uh, we'll see now how we use these products to prevent the attacks. But before this, let's recap the solutions. So from a security perspective, we orchestrate all access use cases. We prevent lateral movement. We remove uh, vulnerable protocols and allow preventing uh, the propagation of uh, malwares to file shares. We really reduce the network attack surface by using the reverse access protocol. We're simple to use. 
It's a solution you deploy it in the network. It's clientless, so it's very easy to deploy and adopt. It's BYOD and BYOPC friendly, right? We don't require clients or agents. It's very cost effective, right? It scales and supports all types of customer sizes and use cases, could be human access applications, connected devices, etc. So let's see how Zone Zero could have helped against the three attacks we talked before. The uh, Pulse Secure hack, the uh, Solar Winds, and the University of San Francisco. So if we look at a solar winds hack, if we would have deployed zone zero MFA in the network, that would have prevented the attack spread because and at any attempt, so the user would have, the hacker would have hacked the Orion system and from there try to jump to other network components. Any one of those jumps would have required an authentication, right? If I'm from the Orion trying to connect to an SMB file share, uh, there would be a domain level authentication by the file share. Or if I'm going to a remote desktop, I need to put in my username and password. Even if there are service accounts, you still need to authenticate. If we would have been in the network, that authentication request would have issued an MFA, let's say to the IT person. And that IT person would have needed to accept the MFA for the connection to work. So at least even if they would have... Uh, allowed the authentication without checking, this would have been a good alert showing there are many, many, many authentication requests because someone is moving laterally throughout the network. So we have prevented the actual Orion hack because that's that would have been done. We would have really reduced the attack spread throughout uh, the network. <clears throat> if we look at the Sherbet insurance company hack through the Pulse Secure, in this case, we would have recommended deploying Zone Zero VPN to really prevent the attack. We would have sat, sat and deployed after the Pulse Secure VPN. So even if the a hacker hacked the Pulse Secure VPN, bypassed the initial authentication, they would have been required to uh, approve the MFA. And that MFA would have maybe even arrived to the original user from whom they stole the credentials. So that user would have been alerted that someone is trying to connect while it's not actually them. This is, would have been prevented the hacker from jumping from the Pulse Secure VPN into the network. It would not have been preventing the actual hack of the, the VPN, but it would have prevented the second vector of jumping from the VPN into the network, that access phase. And if we're looking at the UCSF ransomware attack, deploying Zone Zero MFA or SFA uh, in front of the file shares within the network would have preventing would have prevented uh, modifying and encrypting the SMB file shares, right? We would not have prevented uh, infecting the original endpoint that is on the user who opened the email, but from that endpoint trying to infiltrate the file shares in the network to uh, modify files and encrypt files, that would have been prevented through the protection of the file shares by Zone Zero SFA. So as you can see, by deploying Zone Zero in the network in any one of the use cases, we could have uh, completely prevented or at least really reduced the attack surface for a variety of types of attacks. And that, at this phase, summarizes the presentation. Let's uh, jump over and see a couple of de demos just so you can see the solution uh, working uh, live. So what we see here, this is the authentication portal uh, presented to the user when they access the Zone Zero SDP solution. Now, the authentication flow here is predefined initially. You can have a variety of authentication uh, flows. Could be a basic username and password, as you can see here, or username and password with advanced multi-factor, as we will see in a few uh, seconds. Now, all the, the credentials inputted here into the portal as you recall, are retrieved by the access controller. The access controller sitting in the LAN goes out to the authentication gateway, retrieves the credentials, and goes to the active director. So it's the controller talking to the active director. After I authenticate the user, I know the group the user belongs to, that defines the applications the user can connect to. Only at that point do I open access for that specific user to three specific applications. 
basically three ports, an SSH port, an RDP port, and a web port. And now all the user needs to do is open the remote uh, desktop client, for example, on their machine, their MSTSC client, point it to the safety uh, solution, the access gateway, and connect. And again, there's no network connectivity between the user and the RDP because the user sends the traffic to the access gateway, controller goes out, takes that traffic, and it sends it to the RDP. Same thing I can do with SSH. I can do with any TCP-based application, web, uh, thick applications, etc. If I sign out and connect with a different user, I will have access to different types of applications because I'm connecting with a different user belonging to a different group. Again, using a basic authentication example. <laughs> So different user gets access to different applications. Now we can support a more advanced authentication flow, as you will see now, with, for example, Cisco Duo Push. So I start with a username and password, and then add a push by Cisco Duo. So we have integration with Cisco Duo. We have integration with a company called Imageware for biometric. We have integration with Talis, with Okta with uh, Microsoft. Okay, so we have a variety of integrations um, in order to really enhance the authentication phase. Okay, so whatever you have as an MFA and IDP, we can work with that. And we can also connect, for example, as you can see here with Okta. So the idea here is to allow external access, completely clientless, for external users, non VPN users, could be business partners, could be work from home users to corporate resources. The second demo I want to show you is the Zone Zero VPN. And this use case is what we would have deployed in the case of the, uh, for example, Pulse Secure uh, hack to a way of protect against um, that. What you can see here is a user desktop. We have the, uh, the VPN client, sorry. Let me jump ahead. Okay. So what we have here is a user desktop. The user has a VPN client, which they connect to. In this case, it's a Sophos client. I have Telegram, which we utilize in this demo as a MFA. Again, you can use any, pretty much any third party MFA you want or Telegram or WhatsApp or SMS. And three applications allowed to the user, a file share, a web app, and a remote desktop. Now, I input my credentials. And imagine this, this is a hacker. They input the credentials and connect to the VPN. Now, even though I connect to the VPN, I will not be able to connect to the backend resources until I do not comply to the MFA sent to me by Zone Zero. I get the MFA because the VPN updated Zone Zero the user uh, has been connected. So if I'm now the hacker and I stole Itai's credentials and I try to go into a backend resource, I cannot. Zone zero is blocking my access. I need to confirm to the MFA. I cannot access any of my allowed resources, not the file share, not the web application, not the RDP. Okay, everything is blocked for me. <clears throat> Now, only if I confirm the MFA, and again, this could be even biometric, right? I could put, use my face recognition to connect, for example. You could do it as advanced as you want. Only if I confirm the MFA am I allowed access. And now I can connect, and only to these three applications. I am prevented lateral movement. I can only connect to three specific applications, a file share, a web application, and a remote desktop application. Only three applications out of the entire corporate uh, resources. Now, imagine I'm already connected to the network, either through the VPN or I am a network user. And now envision, for example, a hacker through SolarWinds. I'm in the network. I have the SolarWinds. I'm now from SolarWinds, hacked to some user uh, machine, and from that, trying to open an RDP. And that RDP is configured in zone zero and the network is sensitive. I try to go to this, I will be issued an MFA. 
So this prevents lateral movement because as long as you do not allow FA, you cannot connect. And again, this could be a service account, an application to application scenario, or a actual human user on the VPN or internal to the network. And again, this will work for any corporate application. Could be a remote desktop, could be a file share, could be uh, me opening the SAP application. Whatever you uh, think about as a corporate application will be supported. So basically centrally, centralizing, centrally adding MFA to any corporate application without modifying that application itself. You see, I tried to go to a file share. Again, I am required to put an MFA. So this demo shows you the zone zero VPN and zone zero MFA, and we, show, we saw the zone zero SDP. And this concludes uh, my session.